Our first speaker, as I just introduced, is Dr. Dan Salmezi. He is the director of the program of medicine and religion at the University of Chicago. He is also the associate director of the McLean Center for Medical Ethics, and he is a professor of medicine as well as a professor in the Divinity School. So he really straddles both the worlds of medicine and religion. I mentioned to you previously that he is a former Franciscan friar. Uh, he studied uh, philosophy and ethics at Georgetown under the great late uh, Edmund Pellegrino. Most of us in the bioethics field know about him and his seminal works on medical philosophy. So uh, Dan's going to speak to us today about dignity and Christian thought. Thank you, Dan. Well, thanks. Asim uh, asked if I had any uh, uh, slides, and, uh, and I don't. Uh, my colleague at the Divinity School, uh, the historian Martin Marty, is fond of saying, um, um, power, we all know that power corrupts, uh, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to just, uh, just talk to you um, about um, death, dignity, and Christian uh, thought. And because the concept is so fundamental, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the concept first. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the historical roots, uh, then uh, three categories of uses of the word, um, because it's not uh, univocal, um, and third, about the centrality uh, of the intrinsic meaning of dignity as a foundational notion for ethics, and then uh, delineate what a Christian understanding of respect for intrinsic dignity means for dying persons and those who care for them. Now, the word dignity has a pretty interesting history in Western thought. Um, it's uh, often argued that the idea is an essentially religious one, um, but if that's an argument, it's hard to make the case from Scripture, um, at least from the uh, Hebrew and Christian Scriptures. The Hebrew word uh, that's translated as dignity, uh, gedula, um, occurs only rarely in the Hebrew Scriptures uh, and means something more like nobility of character or personal standing in the community. The Greek word most accurately translated as dignity, axioprepia, um, is not used at all in the New Testament. Um, the phrase to axioma means uh, something closer to worthiness. Um, it's also not found um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, there's another Greek word, semnotes, which is sometimes translated as dignity, but it occurs only three times in the Christian scriptures and is probably better translated as seriousness. So I don't think it's uh, really been a uh, concept that we get from scriptures, at least not directly. Um, so people would think, particularly Christians um, and Catholic Christians, well, maybe it's from Aquinas, the great theologian. Um, well, I can tell you that um, I counted, and you can do this now with computers, 185 times that the word dignitas and its cognates is used in the Summa Theologiae. Um, and it tends to mean the value that something has by virtue of its place in the great chain of being. Um, it's not um, uh, the kind of concept that we have today. Um, for Aquinas, for instance, plants have more dignity than rocks, angels more dignity than human beings. Um, in a nutshell, while it may be that Christians have always had some concept of human dignity, until very recently it had not been developed into either a clearly defined literary form or an internally consistent set of ideas. Uh, another way of saying it would be that the notion if there is a notion, preceded its articulation. And an unarticulated notion is not yet a concept. You can find uses of the word in Aristotle, um, um, but um, they're not very helpful to us. Uh, Roman Stoics, um, particularly Cicero and Seneca, made copious use of the word, um, but it literally meant worthiness. Um, and that's its common political meaning. It meant um, a person's reputation or standing. Hobbes tied dignity to power. He wrote that the value or worth of a man is, as of all things, his price. That is to say, so much as he would be given for the use of his power. And he defined dignity as the public worth of a man, which is the value set on him by the commonwealth. Now, Kant's notion of dignity seems to be a response to Hobbes. Kant writes, in something closer to, I think, our contemporary conception, the respect that I bear others or which another can claim from me is the acknowledgment of the dignity of another man, 
that is a worth which has no price, no equivalent for which the object of valuation could be exchanged. Kant connected this value to freedom as the capacity for moral agency. He writes elsewhere, humanity itself is a dignity. Now this Kantian notion has a more familiar ring to modern ears. It's another very long story, but the Kantian idea of dignity was eventually married to the notion of human beings having been created in the image and the likeness of God, what we all take to have been there for eternity, has not been, um, through a theologian named Antonio Rosmini. This conceptual use of the word dignity eventually made its way into Catholic theology and was for the first time explicitly used in the social encyclical Rerum Novarum in which Pope Leo XIII defined the, defended the dignity of workers in the late 19th century. It's a very long time in coming. It was then by retrospective baptism, if you will, of this Kantian idea that dignity became an important word in Catholic theology. Now, it's going over centuries in a few seconds, but I only have a few minutes. Um, given the history, um, what I want to first point out to you is that it's clear that people use the word dignity and have used it in different ways. I would suggest there are three different uses, historically and uh, contemporary, um, um, that, um, uh, for the word dignity. One is attributed, another is intrinsic, and a third I'll call inflorescent uses of the word dignity. By attributed dignity, I mean the worth or the value that one confers upon others by acts of attribution. The act of conferring this worth or value may be accomplished individually or communally, but it always involves a choice. Attributed dignity is in a sense created. It constitutes a conventional form of value. Thus, we attribute worth or value to those we consider to be dignitaries, those we admire, those who carry themselves in a certain way or have certain talents, skills, or powers. We can even attribute worth or value to ourselves using this word, this way. And I would say that the Hobbesian notion of dignity is an attributed notion of dignity. By contrast, intrinsic dignity denotes the worth or value that people have simply because they're human, not by virtue of any social standing, ability to evoke admiration, or any particular set of talents, skills, or powers. Intrinsic value is the value um, something has by virtue of being the kind of thing that it is. Intrinsic dignity is thus the value that human beings have by virtue of the fact that they are human beings. It's not created, it's not something conferred, it simply is. Kant's notion of dignity, I think, is intrinsic. And third, by inflorescent dignity, I mean the way the people, use, people will use the word to describe the value of a process that's conducive to human excellence or the value of a state of affairs by which an individual expresses human excellence. In other words, inflorescent dignity is used to refer to individuals who are flourishing as human beings, lives that are consistent with and expressive of the intrinsic dignity of the human. Thus, dignity is sometimes used to refer to a virtue, a state of affairs in which a human being habitually acts in a way that expresses the intrinsic value of the human. Aristotle's use of the word, as well as some of the Stoics, is inflorescent. Now these three conceptions of human dignity are by no means exclusive. Attributed, intrinsic, and inflorescent conceptions of dignity are often at play in the same situation. It's extremely valuable, however, to tease out which way a particular speaker is using the word if we're to understand ethical arguments that invoke the word dignity. I want to argue, however, that the notion of intrinsic dignity is the foundational one. To be consistent in our use of moral words, to do the kind of moral work that we want the word dignity to do from any perspective, but I think particularly from a Christian one, the intrinsic notion of dignity will be the central one. This is because first, if you postulate 
Uh, it's necessary to postulate intrinsic dignity in order to make sense of the notions of attributed or inflorescent dignity. By what basis might one attribute dignity to something or say that the thing has inflorescent dignity? It must be because the entity makes, uh, makes it appropriate to use the word dignity in describing it at all. What is prior to both the attributed and inflorescent concepts of dignity is the assumption that the intrinsic value of the entity can be correctly described um, as intrinsic dignity. It would be very odd, for instance, to say that a sea urchin's dignity has been violated. Right? We don't use the word that way. It would also be very odd to say that a sea urchin was behaving in a dignified or an undignified manner. The attributed and inflorescent uses of the word dignity depend upon a crucial assumption about the value of the entity under consideration. The value of the entity is a dignity. And that implies that the intrinsic notion is central. Accordingly, if there are intrinsic values in the world, the recognition of the intrinsic value of something depends on one's ability to discern what kind of a thing it is. And this leads to the notion of natural kinds, a relatively new conception in analytic philosophy. And the fundamental idea behind natural kinds is to, that to pick something out from the rest of the universe, you have to pick it out as a something. This somethingness implies a modest essentialism. That is, the essence by which, uh, the essence of something is that by which one picks it out from the rest of reality as anything at all. The alternative seems inconceivable that reality is actually a completely undifferentiated blob that we human beings carve up for our own purposes. It seems bizarre to think that there are no actual kinds of things in the world independent of human classification. No such things as planets, mosquitoes, or human beings outside of our own choosing. The intrinsic value of a natural entity is the value it has by virtue of being the kind of thing that it is. And I would define intrinsic dignity as the intrinsic value of entities that are members of a natural kind that has as a kind capabilities of language, rationality, love, free will, moral agency, creativity, humor, aesthetic sensibility, and an ability to grasp the finite and the infinite. I presume that includes all of you. Um, it is also, though, anti-speciesist because if there are angels or ET comes to visit us, that it can do all of those things, that entity would also have intrinsic dignity. Importantly, the logic of natural kind suggests that we pick out individuals as members of the kind, not because they express all the necessary and sufficient predicates to be classified as a member of the species, but by virtue of their inclusion under the extension of the natural kind as a kind that has those capacities. In technical language, if there are any philosophers in the room, um, that means that the logic is extensional, not intentional. For example, very few bananas in the bin in the supermarket all express all the necessary and sufficient conditions for being classified as free fruits of the species Musa sapientium. We define a banana as a yellow fruit, but some that you'll see when you go shopping are yellow, some are green, some are spotted, some are brown but we pick them all out as bananas. Now, healthcare depends profoundly upon this extensional logic. For instance, it's not the expression of rationality that makes us human, but our belonging to a kind that is capable of rationality that makes us human. When a human being, for instance, comes into Asim Padella's emergency room um, and is comatose or mentally ill, we first pick that individual out as a human being. We then note the disparity between the characteristics of the afflicted individual and the paradigmatic features and typical development in history of members of the human natural kind. And that's how we come to the very primitive judgment that the person is sick. Because the individual is a member of the human natural kind, we also recognize that this person has the intrinsic value we call dignity and is worthy of our service. The plight of the sick rarely serves the purposes, beliefs, desires, interests, or expectations of any of us as individuals. Rather, it is because of their intrinsic value that we serve them. 
Thus, I would argue that the intrinsic human dignity is the foundation of health care. Intrinsic dignity is a value that commands respect. And to respect something requires both that we recognize its value and that we make choices that are consistent with the proper appreciation of that respect. So if there is such a thing as intrinsic dignity, then intrinsic dignity first requires that it be acknowledged and recognized for its worth, and it means choosing in a way that is compatible with the value one is obliged to recognize. Without this primary respect, there is no form whatsoever of interpersonal morality. We respect rights because we respect, recognize intrinsic dignity. We don't bestow dignity to the extent that we bestow rights. Now, what does all of this large warm-up mean for care of the dying? For human beings, the fact of mortality raises questions about one's worth. Dying raises questions about one's value as one is dying, about the value of the life one may have led up to the moment of death, about whether anything that is valuable about oneself perdures beyond the moment of death. So one major spiritual task for the dying is to reject or to discover or to recover or to affirm their own grasp of their own intrinsic dignity. And as the grounds for attributed dignity fade, as they will inevitably for all of us, um, uh, we fail physically and our inflorescent dignity appears to fail as well. And so dying persons naturally ask, is there nothing more about me except how I feel, how I appear to others, how much I can do without anybody else's help or how productive I can be? The only alternative is to believe that one has an intrinsic value. Consideration of that idea that one has intrinsic value may lead to further questions, such as what is the source of that value? Can such a belief be validated? Does such a value perdure? And these are all spiritual questions, whether raised in a religious context or not. Christianity in particular teaches that one can actually flourish in death through an acceptance of one's own intrinsic value. The value of one's intrinsic dignity, a worth that as our scriptures would hold is more than that of sparrows but less than that of the angels, is our value. We have hearts and minds that reach to the heavens, but we are mortal creatures nonetheless. So in death, Christians must finally and fully accept for themselves, accept themselves for who and what they are in humility and hope. They need to know that they have value by virtue of being the kinds that they think of things that they are, beings in relationship with God and with God's people. But they also need to know that they are finite, morally, intellectually, and physically, and yet loved radically and exuberantly by the God who created them and offers them redemption. No human being deserves such love. But God sees in us what we cannot see in ourselves, and in our faith became incarnate and died to show us that what we could only see imperfectly in ourselves. Death offers us the possibility of seeing this value clearly. An acceptance of our intrinsic value is an integral part of the vision offered to the Christian in death. Now, respect for the dying requires attention to such spiritual struggles. Christians are called to point out in word and in deed the dignity that is already there to be grasped um, by their dying brothers and sisters. The dying need to be reminded of their dignity at a time of fierce doubt. They need to understand that they are not grotesque because of the way disease has altered their appearance, that they are not merely bothersome because they are dependent, that they are not unvalued because they are unproductive, that they are worthy of our time, our attention, and our resources. In short, they need a demonstration that the community affirms their intrinsic dignity. Visiting the sick 
for Roman Catholics, is called one of the corporal works of mercy. Jews, I know, consider it a mitzvah. To the choice to visit the dying is a choice that itself communicates a recognition of the intrinsic dignity of the terminally ill and can assist them in coming to accept their own intrinsic dignity. Christians will also show respect for intrinsic human dignity by action to build up, to the extent possible, the inflorescent dignity of their fellow human beings, provided this does not undermine or contradict the intrinsic human dignity that's the ground of moral action. In other words, to respect someone's intrinsic dignity demands that one show that respect concretely. We do this by meeting their needs in a very concrete way. Respect for the dying is shown by bathing them, by feeding them, by treating their pain, relieving their nausea, helping them to get out of bed. Respect for the dying is shown by being with them, listening to them attentively, and paying careful attention to the lessons they can teach those of us who survive them. Intrinsic dignity is not destroyed by pain or nausea or feelings of dependence or depression. One's intrinsic value or worth is not dependent on any degree of rationality or consciousness. Christians proclaim that by virtue of having been created by God and redeemed in Christ, no one, no one is ever worthless. The dying have this value by virtue of their being human and nothing more. Nonetheless, respect for intrinsic human dignity encompasses an acknowledgement that we are, while of inestimable value, not of infinite value. We are worth more than sparrows, but less than angels, made in the image of God, but not God's. Thus, uh, while there might be an absolute prohibition on killing, the duty to maintain life is finite. The Roman Catholic tradition has called life-sustaining treatments that go beyond what a finite human being can be obliged to bear extraordinary means of care. We respect human life, but we do not worship human life. We cannot make death our aim, but we can forego measures that forestall death, realizing that death will be the likely consequence. In fact, in some cases, trying to stay alive at all costs can be inconsistent with respect for one's own dignity, rooted in a refusal to accept the finitude that is characteristic of the kinds of beings we are, human beings. Thus, withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatments that are futile, burdensome, costly, or complicated, or when their use would interfere with our ability to carry out other moral obligations, is perfectly consistent with respect for the intrinsic dignity of the human. Respect for intrinsic dignity implies that we should act in a manner consistent with our true intrinsic value, neither clinging vainly to this life, nor denying the intrinsic value of this life. Respect for intrinsic dignity also requires attention to the spiritual needs of patients, giving them the space to grow spiritually. Because death will raise questions about meaning, value, and relationship that ultimately have only a transcendent answer. We Christians affirm that this answer has been given to us in Christ and his spirit. The dying person brings his or her entire life to the moment of death, And we believe that if that life has the love of God as the foundation of its value, the source of its hope, and its model of of right relationship, then Christian theology teaches that this is exactly what will be irrevocably, absolutely, and eternally determined in the dying of that patient. One of the most remarkable opportunities I have as a clinician is the privilege of occasionally caring for such patients. When I enter their rooms, I sometimes feel the urge to remove my shoes because I know the ground in which I am about to tread is holy. I find that I myself am the one who is transformed, the one to whom enormous grace has been revealed. This is the gospel's vision of death with dignity, one that Christians must never tire of proclaiming. Thank you.